Gary Leon Ridgeway was born February 18, 1949 in Salt Lake City, Utah. He grew up in what was later named SeaTac, Washington. He was the second of his parents' three sons. His father was a bus driver and his mother was a sales clerk. From the outside looking in, everything seemed normal and happy in his childhood. But underneath the surface, there were problems that couldn't be swept under the rug. Relatives have described Gary's mother as domineering, and they've said that Gary witnessed domestic violence in the home. His father regularly complained about the presence of sex workers. Inside his household, Gary wet the bed until he was 13. This was out of the ordinary, but what was even more unusual was for his mother to wash his genitals after the bed wetting. This resulted in him telling defense psychologists when he was an adolescent, he had conflicting feelings of anger and sexual attraction to his mother and fantasized about killing her. In the mid 60s, when Gary was 16, he did stab someone. It was just not his mother. It was a young boy, only six years old. Gary did it just to see how stabbing worked. He lured the small child in the woods and stabbed him through the ribs into his liver. Fortunately, the little boy survived the attack. In addition to being a cold-blooded psycho, Gary is dyslexic and fell behind in school. He did not graduate until he was 20. He attempted to live a normal life and do what some others were doing at the time. He married his high school sweetheart, Claudia Craig, and joined the Navy. He was sent to Vietnam. He worked on a supply ship and served two years. While in the Navy, he had sex with many sex workers. Protection was not used, which caused him to contract gonorrhea. Even though he was angry that he caught a venereal disease, he continued having sex without using protection. Afterwards, he settled in the Seattle area. Gary got a job painting trucks. He held this job for three decades. During those decades, he had three wives and several girlfriends. His first two marriages ended because of cheating by both partners. His second wife, Marsha Winslow, accused Gehring of putting her in a chokehold. While married to her, he became religious. He went from door to door, reading the Bible aloud at work and at home, insisting that his wife follow the strict teachings of their pastors. He would cry a lot after sermons or reading the Bible. Friends and family characterized Gary as friendly but strange. In contrast to his religious beliefs, he continued to have sex with sex workers and wanted his wife to engage in sex in public and inappropriate places. Surprisingly, he even wanted to have sex in areas where his victims' bodies were later discovered. Gary demanded sex several times a day from his ex-wives and several ex-girlfriends. It was never enough. He wanted to have sex in a public area or the woods. He was insatiable. Gary admitted to having a fixation with sex workers. He had a love-hate relationship with them. Like his father, he complained about their presence in his neighborhood, but he solicited their services regularly at the same time being strictly religious. In 1980, he was arrested for allegedly choking a prostitute, but he was not charged after he claimed the woman had bit him. Two years later, he was back in trouble with the law for solicitation. It is believed that he began killing shortly after. On July 15, 1982, the body of his first victim was discovered. Children found the strangled body of Wendy Caulfield floating in the Green River. Wendy was a runaway who had fled from her foster home. She had only been missing for a week. Over the course of the following weeks, four more bodies were found in or along the riverbank, strangled. On August 15th, 
Three more bodies were found. They were 31-year-old Marcy Chapman, who was found in shallow water next to 17-year-old Cynthia Hines and 16-year-old Opal Mills, whose blue trousers were knotted around her neck, breasts exposed with bruises on her arms and legs. The next day, August 16th, a police task force was created to investigate the killings. The police knew they were dealing with a serial killer. As more victims were discovered in or near the river and near the Seattle Tacoma International Airport, the unknown assailant was given the title, the Green River Killer. Authorities found many bodies naked. They were placed together in groups repeatedly. Some bodies had been posed. Nearly all of them were prostitutes. In 1982, Gary was arrested on a prostitution charge. Subsequently, he became a suspect in the murders, but he passed a polygraph test. He claimed his innocence and was no longer considered to be a prime suspect. Members of the task force had their doubts and held on to samples of his hair and saliva. Task force members Robert Keppel and David Reichardt interviewed incarcerated Ted Bundy several times in 1984. Bundy gave them some insight on the killer. He advised them that the killer was revisiting the dump sites to have sex with his victims, which turned out to be true. And if the police were to find a fresh grave, to stake it out and wait for the killer to come back. In the spring of 1983, an 18-year-old prostitute named Marie Malbar went missing. She was last seen by her boyfriend getting into a paint-patched pickup with a dark-haired man about 30 to 40 years of age. Four days later, the authorities questioned Gary at his home about his knowledge of Marie. He denied knowing her. In November, he was questioned again about the murders and he denied having any knowledge about the victims. The police lacked evidence to connect him to any of the crimes. He later told investigators that he stood against a fence during the questioning to conceal scratches Marie had left on his arm while trying to escape. He also said that after the police left, he burned the scratches with battery acid to disguise them. After 1983, the killing seemed to have stopped. Nevertheless, the police continued to hunt for the killer. Around 1985, Gary began dating Judith Mawson. She became his third wife in 1988. Judith claimed in a TV interview that when she moved in while they were dating, there was no carpet. Detectives later told her that Gary had probably wrapped the body in it. Judith said Gary left for work early some mornings, supposedly for the overtime pay. She surmised that he probably committed some of the murders while he was out pretending to be at work. She made it clear that she had not suspected his crimes before she was contacted by the police in 1987 and she had never heard of the Green River Killer because she didn't watch the news. Gary was interviewed in prison and he revealed that his kill rate went down while he was in a relationship with Judith. Out of all of his 49 known victims, only three were killed while he was with Judith. Judith said he was the perfect husband and that he'd always treated her like a newlywed, even after they had been together for 17 years. She has intimated that she felt she'd save lives by being his wife and making him happy. She was completely unaware that Gary had been tempted to kill her and the urge passed only because it might have increased his chances of getting caught. Nearly two decades later, due to the advancement of technology and more sophisticated DNA testing, samples from 1987 were DNA profiled, providing evidence for Gary's arrest warrant. He was arrested on November 30, 2001 at work on the suspicion of murdering four women. He worked at the Kenworth Truck Factory as a spray painter, the same job he'd had for 30 years. The four victims from the original indictment were Marsha Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, and Carol Ann Christensen. DNA linked conclusively from the semen left in the bodies to the saliva swab taken by the police. 
Three more victims were added to the indictment. Wendy Caulfield, Deborah Bonner, and Deborah Estes, after a forensic scientist identified microscopic spray paint spears as a specific brand and composition of paint used at the Kenworth factory during the specific time frame when these victims were killed. Initially, Gary claimed innocence. He soon changed his tune and confessed, stating that he wanted to kill as many prostitutes as possible. He targeted sex workers because they were easy prey. Therefore, they might not be reported missing, and he hated them. Often, he preyed on runaways. The sex workers he picked up were from truck stops and dive, bomb, dive bars along Highway 99 outside Seattle. He lured victims to his car, gained their trust by showing them pictures of his son. Then he would engage in sexual activity with them and strangle them to death sometimes in the middle of sex. After he murdered his victim, he would then, then dump their bodies in wooded areas around the Green River, which led to him being named the Green River Killer. Gary would purposely contaminate the crime scene with gum and cigarette butts to throw authorities off. He didn't smoke or chew gum. There were times when he would dump the body in one place, leave it for a time, then return to retrieve it and transport it to another location to create a false trail. At least two of his victims were transported all the way to Portland. In 2003, he accepted a plea deal. He was sentenced to 48 consecutive life sentences without parole. Part of the deal stipulated that he would reveal the locations of undiscovered bodies. It was thought that he was responsible for more deaths. In 2018, he confirmed this. He revealed that he'd murdered up to 90 women in total. He said he'd killed so many women that he'd had a hard time keeping them straight. He was sentenced to an additional 10 years for tampering with evidence for each of the 48 victims, adding 480 years to his time. Gary led prosecutors to three bodies. On August 16, 2003, the remains of a 16-year-old Pammy Annette Agent was found near Enumclaw, Washington, 40 feet from State Route 410. She was believed to be a victim of the Green River Killer. In September of 2003, the remains of Marie Malvar and April Buttram was, were found. On November 23, 2005, a hiker found the skull of one of the Green River Killer's victims that he admitted killing in his 2003 plea bargain to King County prosecutors. The skull of another victim, 19-year-old Tracy Winston, was found November 20th, 2005 by a man hiking in a wooded area near Highway 18. She disappeared from Northgate Mall on September 12th, 1983. In 2011, a 49th body was found that was linked to Gary. Another life sentence was added to his term. Gary Ridgway confessed to more confirmed murders than any other serial killer in America at that time. He claimed that murdering the women was his real career. Gary was placed in solitary confinement at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla in January 2004. He was transferred to the USP Florence High, a high security prison east of Canyon City, Colorado on May 14, 2015. A public outcry and discussions with Governor Jay Inslee caused Correction Sec Secretary Bernie Warner announce, to announce that Gary will be transferred back to Washington to be easily accessible for open murder investigations in September 2015. Gary was chartered by plane back to the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla on October 24, 2015, where he would spend the rest of his life. The details in this case are all alleged. Thanks for watching.